Hi everyone, my name is Brian Beach, and I'm going to spend some time today and talk about a new AWS service called Code Catalyst. I'll do that through the lens of .NET and mix in a little bit of PowerShell, given the context here. But I want to talk a bit about uh, a new service. This is something that we originally announced back in November at reInvent, which is our big conference if you're not familiar. And um, it went GA last Wednesday, so just a week and a day. This is you know, brand new, cutting edge stuff here that I have to show you. So, so let me start off. I'll start with just a little bit of background. Uh, my slides are not advancing. I have no idea which direction to go to get my mouse on the screen. There we go. Cool. All right. So again, my name is Brian Beach. I am based out of North Carolina with my family. They are quite a bit older now. I got to really update these pictures. Uh, my oldest is now driving, so. <laughs> They, they made a little bit of progress, and um, I am the author of a book called Pro PowerShell for Amazon Web Services. This was published back in 2013. I'm not recommending you get it. It's so far out of date at this point that I wouldn't waste time on that. Um, but I, just to, to give you a sense of who I am, I've spent most of my career as a .NET developer. Doing a lot of work around the .NET ecosystem and uh, SQL Server, a lot of Microsoft related technologies. I've been now at, at Amazon for just about eight and a half years, so quite a while, and pretty much a generalist during that time. I touched a lot of everything. And at the moment, uh, I'm the tech lead for our builder experience community. So that is all of the people within AWS that are interested in the builder tools. So things like CI CD with the um, code pipeline, code build, if you've used that, code, now code catalyst, which is the newest addition to that family, uh, with infrastructure as code. So things like CloudFormation, CDK, if you've used CDK, I think there was a session on that this week, right? Uh, it's all blurring together at this point. Uh, as well as all of the SDKs, toolkits, and things like that. So if you're interacting with any AWS services, you've probably used our .NET SDKs or the PowerShell toolkits and those things. And so we support a lot of that stuff. Um, so that's, that's who I am, just to give you a sense. And let me jump in. I want to start talking. I'm only going to do a slide or two just to set some context since this is a new product. And then I want to just jump in and do a demo, to give you a sense of what Code Catalyst looks like. So um, Code Catalyst is this new unified software development platform. Right? A big part of what it does is CI CD and helps you to manage your um, the deployment, but it also encompasses the rest of the, the, the DevOps experience. So there's project management capabilities built into there. Um, looking at this, this is just outlining some of those capabilities. So you've got the, the basic things you'd expect, the ability at the top of start code, right? the ability to write your application, to do application development in what we call a dev environment. So rather than working locally, you can work in, uh, in an environment that's running in AWS. This has a lot of advantages. A, being able to size compute to what you need and bring in things like you can use and whatnot when you need them. Um, it would also allow you to have a distinct development environment for everything that you do. And so uh, it eliminates a lot of the dependency issues that you've probably run into, or maybe you're running two different versions of, say, it's usually Python when I run into this. I'm usually tripping over two versions of Python. And it's nice to have distinct environments for everything that I work on. Um, but I'll also show you how this can really help kind of codify the configuration of your dev environment so that as team members are coming and going, you're, you can very easily uh, spin up a new environment that has everything installed that you need. So you know, a new consultant joins the team and we've got everything they need on day one. I know prior to being here, uh, I spent a bunch of time, most of my career, at an accounting firm, at one of the big four accounting firms. And when I started there, it was three weeks before I could do anything productive. It was literally the first many days they printed out source code for one of the applications so that I could read through it because that was the state of you know, working at those days. So the ability to very quickly spin something up, jump right in, and work is great. Then those next few, right, build, test, deploy, those are all the components of your, your CI CD solution. The ability to build your source code, put it through your testing, and then deploy it into AWS. It doesn't have to be, though. We can deploy to anywhere from Code Catalyst, and uh, as well as the project management capabilities. So things like uh, managing your issues, feature requests, pruning your backlog, and, and putting up the Kanban board to, to track 
the progress of your projects. And I'll show you all of this. I'm doing this fairly quickly, but I'll show you all of this in a minute um, in, in a demo. So benefits wise, right, this is really about giving you an end-to-end -end solution to A, accelerate project setup, so you're not going through that machine-by-machine that -machine configuration, automate all those daily, daily processes, things like your CICD workflow, and then um, automate some of the, the configuration of your environments. So let's jump in. I, I want to I'm not big on slides. I always hate this part of the presentation. Let's jump in, and I want to give you a sense of what this actually looks like. So I'm going to, I'm already logged in here. Uh, this is Code Catalyst. Okay. Uh, Touch the Yeah. Sure. Okay. I'm sure I'll regret that in a minute when the screen gets busy. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> is that good? Okay, cool. So, so I'm logged into Code Catalyst here. And I'm logged into my personal space, so it's just my name, Brian Beach. Um, and you can think of a space as a way to organize a series of projects and team members. So I've got right now just one project in here, which is where usually I'm just kicking the tires and testing things. Uh, we'll create a new one in a moment. But to give you a sense of what this looks like, um, my space could have multiple members. At the moment, there's just one. It's me. I'm an administrator. I have full rights to the entire space. I could add other members in here who are collaborating. So you might do this at the business unit level within a large organization, or maybe you just have one space for your entire organization. Okay. Um, there's lots of other things in here that I'm not going to go into. But the other important one is um, I have a, a series of AWS accounts. Again, I only have one here. This is just my playground account where I run experiments and things like that. But I could have multiple accounts that I want to be able to deploy to so that as I'm building an application, uh, I might have here dev, test, and prod because I want to have distinct accounts to separate those and keep them distinct from one another. I could also, though, have things like different um, accounts that are maybe deployed for different customers or um, geographically diverse if I wanted to. And I'll show you some of those examples as we dig in. But I want to make sure you understand that this is here. It was already registered, so it's linked to my AWS account. And if we dig into it, um, there are a couple uh, IAM roles. These are the permissions. This is how we're able to deploy is using what's called uh, an IAM role because this like your credentials to access the environment. What's generally, is everyone, you came to this session, is everyone familiar with AWS and been hands on with AWS in here and these things make sense? Okay, cool, I won't spend as much time drilling into exactly what that means. So well, let's jump back, come back to projects here um, and let's go in and create a new project so you get a sense of what this looks like. So when I create a project, I've got a couple options. I can start from scratch, and essentially what that means is it's just going to create an empty project for me. Right? I'm going to get an empty repository, and I can spin up my IDE and just start working and, and put stuff into it. Um, not terribly exciting. I can also bring my own code. So maybe there's something that already exists out in the world. Maybe you've got a project out on GitHub that you want to use in Code Catalyst, so you can do that too. Right? And here I would just say, oh, I'm going to go to a GitHub repository and pull that content in and use it within Code Catalyst. But probably the, the most exciting and interesting way to start is using a blueprint. And you can think of a blueprint, this is like a template, a template for a new project that I'm going to create. But it's more than just a static template. It's really a dynamic template. It's actually a small application that runs. So it's extremely configurable. You can put in lots of different configuration parameters to, um, to tune exactly what's going to be deployed into my new project. All right. Um, and there's lots of starting points, as you would expect. We've got things like, say, a single page application here. This will handle React, Vue, um, Angular frameworks for the front end of an app. Uh, there are things like serverless applications. This is the one we're going to use in a demo, as well as lots of others. So uh, some more AWS-specific ones. Um, Blue is an ETL solution. There's things like um, the, the static website for Hugo and Jekyll. This is the one I usually demo, but given the context here, we'll do .NET. And then there's others that are more like reference architectures. So the to-do app is really a fully built, rather than being a foundational starting point where you're going to add your own code, this is intended to be more like, let's look at a reference architecture for what could be with a fully built out application. Not that a to-do application is um, terribly complex, of course, but just to give you a sense of what's possible. Most of these, though, are, are foundational, where you're using them as a starting point. So let's drill in. If I grab this .NET serverless application, uh, I can read a little bit more about what that does, and it'll give me an overview of the architecture. Essentially, if you're familiar with serverless applications, right, this is going to spin up a Lambda function that's based on .NET, and it's going to put an API gateway RESTful interface in front of it. 
there's roughly a pattern that this is going to implement when we do it. Um, they don't all follow, of course, that pattern. It's just this serverless app. And of course, it walks you through the details, like what permissions am I going to need to be able to deploy? I'm going to do this in a demo. Okay. And if we come in here, let's call this, oh, I don't know, remember what we're adding. So we're talking about demo, maybe just to be unique. And here's that account connection that I was talking about earlier, right? I've already pre provisioned and, and pre registered an account here called development. Um, and I'm going to use this admin role to deploy it. And then down below, here's where it, it starts to get um, unique to the different blueprints. So I have a lot of different configuration options unique to the blueprint that I've picked. And in this case, there's lots of um, .NET variants here. I can do things like an empty C sharp or F sharp project. I'm going to go with a simple um, ASP net core C sharp function. And I can change other things too. Uh, as I said, this is very dynamic, so this, this blueprint is going to build my starting point, build my project for And I can configure all of that. We'll look at another one too later that is maybe a little bit more, that has a lot more configuration option if you get better sense. And so this will go out and build all the resources to initialize my project. Or we can take a look at exactly what that, what's in there. So I'll start with the source code. I'm going to drill in here. I'm going to look at source repositories. There's only one. I could have multiple repositories within the project if I needed it. And in this case, it's created the scaffolding for my serverless function, as you would expect to see. And this looks very much like what you'd expect to see as a .NET development. Okay. Um, rather than look at it here, though, I'd rather look at it in my IDE. And there's a couple things I could do. I could, of course, clone this repository locally, as you would normally. But I think the more interesting, more exciting capability that comes from Code Catalyst is this ability to create a dev environment. And so the dev environment is going to run, again, in AWS. This is essentially a container. I'll talk a little bit why I say essentially, because it's, it's more than just a container. We do quite a bit to configure this. But it's going to launch a container within AWS, and that's where I'm actually going to be working. So again, it's, it's isolated. I don't have to worry about the dependencies on my local machine and the tools that are installed. And I've got some options. So uh, AWS Cloud 9 is our IDE run right in the browser. I could click that and it would just spawn a new tab. Or I could use uh, VS Code or any of the JetBrains IDEs listed here. And so I could and will just go with VS Code. So I'm going to go to, I'm going to launch in VS Code. And, and now I could, of course, create a new branch to work in. And we could do a PR later. Being a demo, I'm going to keep this really simple to work right in main because I'm an architect and never follow. Good policy. So we see a couple things are happening here. One, back in, in the browser, back here, you can see that Code Catalyst is launching a new dev environment. So essentially, it's creating this new container for me. It doesn't take 30 seconds. It's probably 10. Uh, and there it is. So it's launched a new container for my dev environment. And then um, the, oh, I'm not logged in. Sorry. Play It's always turning into a negative one down. Cool. So, let me just relaunch that. Okay, there it is. So, the AWS toolkit it, that's part of Visual Studio, right? I've installed that in Visual Studio. It sees that. There's a new container running a new dev environment, and it's going to set that up. So the, you know, the work of setting up the SSH tunnel to connect to and do remote development, uh, the toolkit takes care of all that for me, and um, it looks a lot more seamless when I'm properly logged in. And so I end up now in um, Studio. My C# -sharp extension just never installs properly. It, and here I am now back in that same project. Right, it's been uh, it's been cloned not to my local machine, but to that that container that's running the dev environment that's running in AWS. And you can see I'm just connected to it over SSH and working locally. It feels very much like that local experience, but it's actually running uh, up in AWS. So, um, has everyone played with .NET functions in Lambda a little bit? Uh, let's take a look at what it looks like. I don't see a lot of heads nodding. So if we come into that same source serverless app that we were looking at before, uh, 
Assuming you've done some ASP.NET development in your life, uh, let's get a look at this. Uh, this is essentially the standard entry point that you would have, right? This is where we're going to create a builder and then launch a, a new ASP.NET application. Uh, this is what would still happen if you ran this from the command line, right? If you're doing this in debug mode and running from the command line, you would handle that here. And then these projects also have the Lambda entry point. And this is the entry point where Lambda will call into that same um, ASP.NET application. Okay, how is this? Is it, I need to make this bigger. Good enough. Um, so this Lambda entry point, this is where Lambda will call into that ASP.NET application. And essentially, right, the model's a little bit different. Um, in, in these serverless applications, you're just getting a single request, and it's pre-parsed by API Gateway, so essentially it's just handing you off, here's the JSON blob that describes what I received, and that gets passed in. And so really the only difference is um, the, the type that we're implementing. Right? What, what, is, what is being passed into this function when we start up? And there's lots of different things. Right? We can do, it's not just API Gateway that could front this, there's a lot of other ways we could initiate a Lambda function. Okay. And everything else, though, is pretty much the same as you would expect to see. And everything else is, is just vanilla uh, ASP.NET. So all of this looks as you would expect to see in startup. And you can see here, for, um, for simplicity, there's just a hard-coded like hello world here. And so I can say like, hello um, PowerShell Summit. You know, this is unique, and we've got a change here. All right, um, and then we could do, uh, let's see, I really didn't want to test this. So we could then commit this and send it back. So let's do that. I'm going to go in and commit this change. That's not quick. That's not cooperating. How many scale? There it goes. Right. Let's we'll save that. Make we'll commit that change, and that'll push it back to back up into code catalyst. All right, so we made just a simple change, push that back to give you a sense of what that experience looks like. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about these, these dev environments and kind of the power and what you can do with, with the dev environment. So um, I think what makes this really interesting is if you come into, this is the AWS toolkit that's installed. This is how I would make configuration changes to any of the AWS products. And I'll come into Code Catalyst here and go to settings. Okay, and um, you can see that this the dev environment is driven by and configured by this thing called a dev file. So if I open that up in the editor, this is the definition for what's happening in this environment. And this is just a pure vanilla dev file. I haven't done anything to it as part of this blueprint in this project. So if we come in and look at it, you can see that the main portion of this is what's called the component. And if you drill in, um, obviously this is a container and there's a pointer to a, a repository where it's going to pull the image from. This one is the MDE, the Managed Dev Environment uh, Universal Image. So this is the development environment that has tools on it for most everything that you want to do, generally. Uh, one thing it doesn't have, though, that's particularly relevant here is uh, PowerShell. It's not installed here, so uh, if I do a you know, SH, that's not installed. So let's look at how we could configure this to get a sense of how we could use this concept of dev file to configure these dev environments and make changes to them. Uh, I'm going to copy this in. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to define a new section called commands, and I'm going to add a couple commands that I want to run. So in this case, uh, I'm going to install PowerShell. The first thing I'm going to do is add the, uh, the Yum repo, Microsoft Yum repo. This is a Linux-based dev environment. And then I'm going to install PowerShell. So I'm going to download the, the repo file, register that, and then I'm just going to do a yum install PowerShell. And I can set up these events that run 
post process. So essentially, after this launches, I want you to go and run these additional commands for me. Does that make sense? Okay. So I'll leave that for a minute and I'll just go back into settings here. Hopefully, it has detected that that changed. Yeah, it sees that the dev file has changed and I hit restart. And it should then go and restart my dev environment for me to process the new changes that have been added into that configuration file. All right. Um, Oops, it hasn't restored. I'm rushing it too much. So if we give that a second, it will go through and it'll reprocess that file, and then uh, these commands that it, that are added will be installed. And so, what's great about this? This is a really trivial example. Is I could then um, once this is done, this becomes part of my source code. This gets pushed back. I can commit this, put it in the source code, and now every new developer that joins the team has all the tools they need pre-installed. Right, um, so I can I can configure this environment with everything that we need. If I bring a new consultant onto the team, maybe you know we've probably done things like I have, where we bring a consultant in for a short period of time, we bring them in for maybe three or four weeks, and you end up spending two or three days just getting them off the ground and getting them to the point where they can work. Imagine a scenario where they could just immediately go into the repository, say I want to work. It spins up this environment for them, and they're good to go. So, um, right, this is super powerful. Essentially, on the yeah, so it's gone behind the scenes and installed PowerShell for me. It reprocessed that file. That said, this is a really trivial example still, right? All I'm doing is adding a couple commands. Um, I can do much more powerful things with this. So, for example, notice that this component, this container, is an array. Right? It can have many containers here. So I can do really interesting things like add additional sidecar containers. Maybe I've got you know, a MySQL or Postgres database that's part of my application, I can add another container in here that's running Postgres and make that part of it. So I've got a dev image and then my Postgres container, and when I spin up, both of those launch. And that's part of that definition. So all of that's coming along as part of the developer experience uh, and making life much, much easier. Uh, this isn't unique to us. Like we did a lot of the original work on DevFile, but there's a site, devfile.io, that kind of lays out all the capabilities that that you can do with this. Um, and there's a bunch of other collaborators, IBM, uh, JetBrains, and, and a few others that are collaborating on this. If you come into the docs, you can look at some of the different things you can do. So um, particularly, right, I can do things here under components, like add containers and add additional volumes, um, even pull in some Kubernetes resources and things into it. And then there's all the command stuff that I was showing you where I can add additional commands that I want to run, and then the different hooks for when they run in the process. Mine was just running on launch, uh, along with lots of other things that you can configure in the So this is very um, configurable and extendable. It gives you the ability to codify all the rules declaratively so that you can uh, bring on new developers quickly and, and keep things moving. OK, so we pushed that, that change back. Um, there is another change now because I've touched the dev file. I'm not going to push that back. There's no reason to commit that in this simple one that we did. You get the point. Let's come back into Code Catalyst and, and sort of keep exploring and get a sense of the rest of the capabilities. So if I come over to commits, we should see here's that initial commit. That happened when the blueprint rendered the project, and then there's the demo. And that was the, the change that I just made when I was demoing and push. This is the one that, that essentially changed that string to say, um, hello, PowerShell Summit, or whatever it is, I remember I forgot. OK, uh, we did that really simply. I could have done a pull request, of course. I'm not doing that here. And we've talked all about dev environments already, but a few things that I do want to call out. This is a, a container or a collection of containers that's running. Um, and we do manage things like the timeout. So you can set an automatic timeout so that if I'm not actively using it, it'll just essentially put that to sleep. I don't persist memory so that it comes back in, a, in the same state you're in, but it'll put it to sleep so you're not paying for these running machines all the time when you're not active. And it'll manage that for you. Next, let's, let's move into CI CD. Right, this is the, the automated build capabilities. And the core of this is what we call the workflow. This is your CI CD pipeline. So uh, in this particular blueprint, you created two. One for a pull request. This is how you would do things like probably run a series of linters and, and things to look at code quality. Um, and then main, which is when I commit something to main, this is my deploy. This is going to go through and deploy this function for me, this serverless function. And we can see it's had two runs. So, so 13 minutes ago, that was when I started the project. That was that initial commit that created it. And it ran and pushed that, whatever the original string was that I overall. Um, 
And then there was another run here that resulted from me making that second portion after I made the change. So we go in and take a look at this. All right, you can see here I've got the um, this workflow. This is where it's going to the screen my portion is going to start to kill me. I'm trying to look at anything over here. So let's take a look at what's happening in here. So first, there's a build. Build and test is running. And so um, these are generic actions. And I'll talk about some of the different actions, actions being the shapes that make up the workflow. Uh, these are pretty generic. They just run a series of CLI commands. And so here, what it's doing is, of course, doing a, a .NET build and building this, and then running a series of unit tests against it. Um, you can go in the outcomes of that. They're not terribly exciting. Let me see the logs for it. All right. In addition, I can come over and look at the reports. And this is a visualization of the results of that rock right, of the unit test that we can see here. Um, it's not reporting any code coverage right now. It wasn't configured. If it did, it would also report on code coverage, branch coverage, and things like that. And I'll talk more about some of the report capabilities when we go into edit and take a look. And then second, it does a deploy. And in this case, um, it's going to install the, uh, the AWS Lambda tools or the .NET CLI and then do a, uh, a .NET Lambda deploy service and push that change that I made up into AWS into my account. Okay. And if we come take a look at that, we should see all the way down the bottom this nice URL for my serverless function that gave me that. And boom, right, hello, PowerShell sub. If you can't read, super tiny. Um, so just to prove that this is working. And of course, if we jump into my account, probably will get also. If I come into here and we go to, I'm pretty sure we can deploy that to Oregon. I think that's what it said. When I pick the defaults, the default formation. That deploy command sits atop cloud formation. See if everyone's familiar with cloud formation. It's our um, infrastructure as code solution. So we can see here that serverless stack is being deployed and the resources are um, the, the .NET function and then the RESTful API that sits in front of it, and if we come and take a look at it, you see that here as well. Here's that .NET function running in Lambda. Okay. So that's just a really trivial example. I want to go into edit and give you a sense of what's, what you can do with workflows. So if we come in and take a look at this, um, the, the workflow itself is just the YAML file. Right? It's defined as YAML and stored as part of my source code, like everything else here. Uh, it's easier to look at it in the visual designer, though. I can edit it in the visual designer. And then we get a sense of what these look like. So first, um, the source. This is just being triggered on a push to main. But I could also trigger on pull requests so that I could do things like um, automate maybe some of my code reviews and whatnot. Um, I could I could wildcard these branches. It doesn't have to be a hard-coded one. So I could do like feature dash star and capture anything that starts with feature if I wanted to have um, build new environments maybe for every feature branch. And you can use um, blob patterns to, to only trigger when certain things change within the path. So if you do things like uh, if you're managing a mono repo with multiple projects, if you have projects and docs, maybe you want to have different pipelines to build those depending on what changes. So you can handle all of that. And then as we continue here, um, we look at the, the build and test. If we come over to configuration, you'll see um, first, there's no environment. We talked a little bit about those deployment environments. The build doesn't need that. It's not going to go anywhere. It's just a local thing that happens. Um, and then there are those steps, right? the build and test steps. So these are just generic actions where I'm going to give it a series of commands to run. This one's actually really similar. But in this case, I do have an environment I'm going to deploy. So in this case, I want to deploy to that dev environment we talked about using the admin role. And then this is the one that installs the AWS tools and deploys it. OK. So, those are reasonably trivial. Oh, I said I'd show you some of the um, report configurations. So we looked at that report before that was showing us the results of the unit test. Uh, this is where that's configured. And so we could add other reports here. And um, there's a couple different types that I can run. So we looked at tests. We could also do code coverage. We could report on code coverage. Um, we can do stuff like static analysis. So if you're running linters or similar, and you want to look for um, and break the build on certain types of errors. Maybe if there's a you know security issue or something like that, right? Um, there's a couple different formats that are supported here, and then I can uh, determine the success criteria. Things. When do I want to? What 
under what conditions do I want to break the build and not move forward? So I might say, if there's a security vulnerability of any level, I want to know about that, but for bugs, maybe I'm only interested in the that you want to still tell me about all the thing, if they can little details that you worry about. Um, and then last, we can do um, security concerns. So with a, anything that can output a serif file, it will support, and so that would be like if you're maybe generating a software bill of materials at the beginning of your build, and then looking at um, software composition analysis, going looking for CDEs based on all the packages that are in that, um, it can report on that and pick those up too, and we can write rules around when to break the build for those use cases. Okay. Um, for the most part though, this very trivial example is only using these build actions, which are, are super generic. So let's look at what else we can do with this. Uh, the build and test actions, those are the ones where I'm just gonna give it a series of commands that I want to run. And then there's a bunch of generally AWS specific deployment options that are here. So things like I wanna deploy a SAM for the service application model, ECR is the container registry, push to amplify hosting, uh, CloudFormation, uh, CDK deployments, and a bunch more are all supported here. Um, if there's something else you wanna do though, maybe you're deploying to something other than AWS, uh, this also supports most GitHub Actions. So I can run just about any GitHub Action as part of these workflows. And I can use that to do things that we haven't built out yet. For example, um, I'll use Superlinter in a moment, and we can do a bunch of linting against this. Um, I'm using it in demos for serverless framework, and those kinds of examples that aren't AWS-specific things, um, as well as deploying to other environments. So maybe you want to deploy to an on-prem environment or something outside of AWS, you could do that here using GitHub actions. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Uh, there's a whole series here of curated actions. If you don't find the one you want though, you could just use this kind of generic GitHub action, click the GitHub marketplace and just grab the, the YAML definition and drop it in there and it will use it. Uh, these, these are really just well-known ones that we know customers are using every day. So let me add this, um, get this out of the way since we've got so little screen real estate. So it's added the link, I want my linter to run before my build, I don't want to even bother going through the build steps. If, it, if the linter picks up issues, so let's do that first. I'll set that precedent up with depends on. And then in here, if you come look at this configuration, um, it's pretty simple, right? This is just doing, it's just simply using statement here for uh, superlinter. Probably I should qualify this to use superlinter. It runs like every linter on known to man on the entire repository unless you narrow it down. So I probably want to say, oh, I only want to test.net code or in this folder, don't, don't run against everything. All right, um, the other thing you can do, of course, is if you do uh, go to GitHub Marketplace, it's so like if we go maybe grab the serverless or serverless deploy, you can essentially just come up here and grab one of these definitions. Uh, and go up here. I could just paste this in here. Uh, I didn't copy, but I could just paste that in here and uh, it would run that one instead of this super linter that's So validate that and that run. So I'm committing this. This is, again, this is a YAML file. It's part of my source code, so it's going to get saved back into the source repository and that will kick off another run. I started another execution of this pipeline and so you should see in, the, in a second or two that this starts executing again. No point really waiting for that. We talked about environment really again. Just want to give you a sense of, of the rest of the capabilities here. So, kind of rounding this out, um, under CI/CD, we have so far been using just what we call on-demand compute, and I can do that. Just means it's going to spin up an instance, it's going to execute this job, and then throw it away. And that can be either a Lambda function or an EC2 instance. Right? It's always container-based, but it's going to run it in one of those two environments. The Lambda function is super fast; it comes up and just immediately starts running. EC2 variant takes a little bit longer to boot up, but you can do a lot more. If you're building container images and stuff as part of your build, you can do that on an EC2 so that you can accomplish that if you don't like the function. Good. Uh, what I can do here, though, is I can set up some um, persistent machines. So maybe I want a single machine that's always around. I don't have to worry then about the startup time of the tasks as it's provisioning resources for me. And I can also use it to constrain my environment. So I, I might want to say, well, I just want one machine. I don't want to pay for any more than one machine ever. I don't want you to just willy-nilly spin up things as builds are happening. I'd rather that builds wait. Just give me one machine, and if a bunch of builds happen, just queue them up and run them all on this one machine. I want to know exactly how much this is going to cost me. And you can handle that here. 
And to give you a sense, right, this will support uh, Linux or Windows servers for builds, and then I can also do you know, Intel AMD architecture, or I can run an ARM 64 build, which will run on our Graviton instances behind the scenes. Um, generally, the costly things can be 20, 30, 40% less if you're running on ARM for the same workload. So there's good reason to build on them as well as use them for your deployment architectures. Um, there's a secrets management capability built in. I don't have any secrets because I'm using an AWS environment. When I'm deploying to AWS, the environment gives me everything I need to handle that deployment. Um, there are other times, though, where maybe I need a secret. Maybe I'm going to log into a database or deploy something on-prem, and then I need to manage some secrets to accomplish that, so I can do that here. Um, reports. We've already seen an example of a report. Right, these are those build, this is the build report. If there were multiple things happening, if I were doing unit tests, code coverage, security, vulnerability findings, I could aggregate all that here and bring it all together. And I could look at what happens over time, too. We can see kind of trends, what's happening from build to build to build. What are those common issues that we're seeing? All right, and then, um, how are we doing on time? Yeah, we got about five minutes left. So the last thing I want to talk about is, Let's go create an issue. Um, issue tracking is that project management capability. So this is the ability to uh, manage your, your feature requests, your issues, put them in a backlog, prune all of that. Uh, we can see there's a Kanban board here. There's nothing in it yet, so it's hard to recognize, but right, I've actually do in process, um, in review, done. Uh, this is all configurable. So if I wanted to, I could change those statuses, um, turn off lots of features here. How do I want to handle estimation? Maybe just t-shirt side. And I can create some other capabilities. So let's go and actually add something to this. Create an issue. Um, let's say use MVC. And when I type an issue, these are uh, these are really rich. It's using markdown syntax, but I've got rich capabilities like an at sign will bring up the ability to search. So I could maybe mention somebody in here, like me. And I say, hey Brian. Um, it's a, you know, stop, hard coding, responses, views, see, controllers, in, and I can also mention, I can also do things like mention sections of code, like, hey, go look at this file, right? And then when I get this, it will point me, it'll notify me, I'll be notified, and it will also um, tell me where to look. Right, you'll look in this file, you should be good over here. And I'll just leave that in to do, and I'll set this as, this is medium priority, and this is a pretty small change. I could also use labels to handle things like sprints, and say maybe this is in uh, sprint one. And let's create that issue. All right, and then once this is filled out, I can just move these things around through the different stages of development. So, so this brings all of those capabilities together in one place. Cool, so let me stop there. I think we've done enough on, on Code Catalyst. Questions or anything about this? Yeah. To use um, GitHub Actions in your workflows, does your repository need to be in GitHub? No. No, this one isn't. Um, May still be running if you don't qualify that one directly. I'm not sure that it wasn't happy. But no, it doesn't have to be. Um, it can run against any repository. Um, it brings up a good point, though. I didn't really talk about this. If we go back to um, the space settings, there's a lot of extensibility options that I haven't talked about here um, that, you know, that I can configure. So, for example, Everything we're doing right now, I just kept the source code right in Code Catalyst. But it doesn't have to be. Um, a lot of the different components are very pluggable. So I could use a GitHub repository, leave my code in GitHub, but still work on it here. And that GitHub repository would show up in the list of repositories alongside my ones that are part of Code Catalyst. Um, we also are doing integrations similarly with lots of, lots of others that will come in the future, right? So uh, I don't have timelines or, or exact commitments or anything. I'm not close enough to know that. But I assume, you know, big GitLabs and, and 
whatnot will fit a bucket and those will come soon. And then it's not just the repository. So like the issue tracking capability, we can swap out. So if you're a Jira user, you can put Jira in there and they'll just swap out that issue tracking capability and use Jira, but you're still working day to day with it code catalogs. So it's, it's extensible that way. There's other things too that I'm not thinking of. Oh, some of the actions, okay, we didn't look at it. Some of those actions are made by third parties. It's like doing security scans, on men is an option. Did anyone talk about uh, Code Whisperer at all this week? The other cool thing, right? You can't not talk about like generative AI stuff these days. You just have to bring it up. It's, it's just part of everything we do, I guess. Um, so let's talk a little bit. Uh, Code Whisperer is, again, it's been around for a little while. I think that released just about a year ago in preview. And then it also became generally available two weeks ago, I think. There's a lot of things have, have rolled out really quickly. Um, so Code Whisperer uh, will, it, it sort of helps you with development, right? So using generative AI to help you in your day-to-day -day development <laughs> activities. And so um, as I'm, if I were just sitting here coding, it would be making suggestions and offering to help finish things. But the other thing it can do is you can just give it prompts as comments, and it will go in and uh, write code for you, It'll just author code for you. So for example, I might say, um, that this is a function to upload a file to S3. Right, and it's finishing that for me. Um, I spelled that wrong for me. Let me fix that simple. So an S3 bucket, and if I hit this, right, it'll say, okay, I'll, I'll create a class, S3 helper, yeah, I'm okay with that, and I hit enter, and then it should say, oh, here's a whole, you know, here's an implementation of that. Whoops. So this is an AWS example, but it doesn't have to be. I could do other things like, um, let's do a function to validate an email address address using a using a function. And fill out that, right? It will class for me, great, I like that one. And then oh, here's, a, here's a function to validate an email address, right? So, those common things, um, regex expressions are especially valuable to me because I can never remember this syntax, it's miserable. So, um, so Code Whisperer will just kind of ride along with you and as you're working, it's just making suggestions like this. And when you're doing really simple things, like these ones, you just put in a comment and it pops it up. And I shouldn't say simple, right? these can be pretty complex too. And you can build them up over time. So I might have, uh, maybe this is just a you know validator class and I can put a bunch of these in here, just put comments in and it will just keep adding new things for me. So yeah, I'm surprised we talked about that one. Um, and this is quite a bit. Uh, in preview, it only supported a couple languages, but when it rolled out, general, generally available, it's supporting a bunch of languages. All the ones you would normally expect, you know, the, the Pythons and JavaScripts and TypeScripts and .NET and Java. Um, but then they added like Rust and Go and SQL and a bunch of others as part of the GA. So there's, there's a ton of them in there now. And it's real, really powerful. I've had this running for a while. And it's been it's just a game changer. For all these things that you would normally be looking up. Right? I, would, I would not have tried to do that. I would Google that and copy and paste it. Um, and this just, it saves you a ton of time. Just put these in and let it do it for you. We are right at time. So any questions about any of this, I can hang out. And... No? Okay. Thank you. Good. Yeah, that's really rough to look at. All right, great. Thanks. I appreciate it.